So we've got accounts across soccer, horse racing, which is enormous in the UK for gambling. Um, and then we started to leverage those audiences to build products to suit their needs, basically. So we built an app that you would input your bet into and they would track it and give you alerts and tell you when goals had gone in and if, if the legs had won. And that was the first real foray into products for us. And we very quickly saw how much it resonated. We want to give everyone the, all the information they could possibly need to make an informed decision. And then that's basically where we cut off and we draw the line there and then say, that's where now it's on you as the better to decide if you want to make that bet. That human guardrail with AI tools is probably important. If you don't want you don't want a hallucination on a one of your influencers hallucinating, and then that's excusable, but not the not not the model. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody go download Flashbix. Um, Flashbix. <laughs> you can, yeah, so you, you won't see us over. as any of the social influencers, so don't you not, worry. Not yet. Yeah, yeah you, you guys actually <laughs> seem to have some credibility. <laughs> I wish we had a subscription thing where we could give Data Art its own promo code, but we're yeah, it's free to yeah. use, so we don't need to do that. Uh, that's great. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another episode of Sports Betting Conversations. Today, we're joined by Callum Broxton from Checked. Callum, welcome to the show. Um, please tell us a little about yourself. Thanks, Russell. Yeah, um, really good to be on. I've watched your the clips and the listened to the various podcasts over the years, so it's good to it's weird to finally be like speaking to you person to person um Thank you. yeah it's been it's been a an interesting one for me because i didn't definitely didn't go the traditional route in terms of career uh, progression or finding the job in the industry i was doing a little bit of traveling after um after high school before college didn't want to go to college at the time wasn't fully committed on the idea so i thought what better way of putting that off than going away for a little bit and just seeing a bit of america i'd always wanted to come i'd never been as a kid um, and I did a bit of traveling around on my own, just did like a little horseshoe from East Coast to West Coast and back. And it was while I was on that trip that I was scrolling through Twitter, saw a tweet from an account I followed for three or four years at the time. And it turned out that that account was owned by Checked, And that was one of our big soccer tipster accounts in the UK. They were looking for people to help run their social media channels. So I emailed in an application with a little bit of a like a Photoshop. We wanted to see something creative. And then I had a Skype interview in the be- the B&B bedroom that I was in, um, in Los Angeles. And then <laughs> after that, I had a follow-up interview when I got home. And I've been there for seven and a half years since then. So it's been, like I say, a completely bizarre way into the industry. Definitely didn't plan on it or uh, did, didn't, didn't see it lasting this long when you start off a, a job in social media and you think, this is fun, but where does this go? And then the, the best thing was the timing was great. The company just grew and grew. There was, I think, eight to 10 of us at the time when I started and the company was only three years old and then it's just grown into what it is today, which is we've got 50 odd people now. We've got dev team, we've got media team, we've got the US team. And yeah, it's kind of crazy when I look back and <laughs> think about where it all started and where where we were back then as well. Uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty cool, like how you, you know, applied and interviewed and <laughs> sometimes you know think things work out in mysterious ways but that's great yeah 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 definitely because of the way twitter was as well back then with the algorithm it was chronological so if i had not gone on twitter for another half an hour never would have seen the tweet never would have got the job wouldn't be sat here now talking to you guys so it was one of those things it just happened it all came together yeah yeah that's pretty cool so t- tell us about check and we understand that you do like a, a few different things um like both uh um in the u.s and abroad um what what does the company actually do so we've got three arms of the business really we've got the core of the company which is checks media which sits in the uk market um we've got 12 years worth of relationships with the operators over there so we very well established we're sort of up there with in the uk with us checker um, the Spotlight Sport Group, um, Katina as well. So we're sort of in that in that ballpark in the UK with the brands we've got, super powerful social first brands. So we've got accounts across soccer, horse racing, which is enormous in the UK for gambling. Um, and then we started to leverage those audiences to build products to suit their needs, basically, and make their lives easier from a betting point of view. So that's always been sort of like at the core of the media businesses, right? We've got this audience, which is great, but they're on social so we need to find a way of bringing them onto our platforms and we can do that by helping them and we build products that like i say make their betting lives much easier then we've got checked dev as well which 
is our in-house product team, basically, um, who do an amazing job at bringing all of our ideas to life. And they've done a great job with the Betting Hub app that we've got in the UK. They've got a huge role to play in the US products that we're building as well. And then there's also a huge B2B element where we have sort of accidentally figured out that if we build something pretty cool for ourselves that we think our audience will like, then at some point the operators will say, that's pretty cool. We'd also like to have that on our platform, please. So we're then able to do some B2B work with that and transfer those products over to various operator partners. So it's a proper mix on the dev side of a lot of B2C and sort of proof of concepts. And then we're able to leverage that into B2B. And then in the US, going down the affiliate route again, sort of our bread and butter, really. We launched a few social brands and accounts, uh, I think it's two and a half years ago now. Um, and then those have grown and as we build our audience, we've been able to bring them products again, same sort of business model as the UK, bring them products that we think will help them. And then as a result of that, you then have deeper relationships with operators. Because it was interesting when we sort of came over to the US, there was a few links we had, plus the group obviously owning FanDuel and having four, four massive UK brands as well. It helps in the initial conversations of, look, we know what we're doing in the UK market, but the US was obviously so different and it was almost like a case of starting from scratch, which was difficult and unusual for us because we're normally in a position where we can just rely on the length of time we've been in a market and those relationships we had. So we literally started from scratch and built everything up again. And now we're in a really strong position two and a half years in where we built the US business. It's sort of making up it's almost a quarter of the revenue now of the group. So it's gone from strength to strength, really. And really, it was our first international market we'd ever gone into. So it was a real test on all fronts for us. Um, but yeah, like I say, it's, it's been pretty successful and from what we're seeing this year as well, it's going to keep growing. Yeah. In interesting. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of, uh, the U S market, do you primarily look at kind of the, the big players, uh, sports books, or do you look, or do you look at other companies within the sports betting ecosystem as well? Predominantly the the sort of tier one, tier two operators. Obviously, it's mm -hmm. been a bit of consolidation over the yeah. past well few months and year. So we've seen that pool shrink a little bit, but there's still new players coming into the market. Like Fanatics were a huge one. Um, ESPN bet still haven't like really rolled out like a major affiliate program as of yet, but that'll be coming down the pike at some point. And then you've also got Bet365, who are always the one that I say are my dark horse for hoovering up a loss of market share. I think they're in two to three years. I'm assuming it's their plan to be in all the states that are legal. I don't see why why not. And if they do that, then I think their products and the way they um, they go about their marketing campaigns and affiliate partnerships, I really do think they could be well secure in that top five of market share, if not higher. Yeah, yeah, I've seen the Bet365 app, and I mean, they're pretty pretty compelling. Yeah, compared to to the others, so I think that they will do well. Uh, once, once they hit kind of the big states here, like New York, um, you know, Massachusetts, and and we're still waiting for the other states, the bigger states, to go live as well. So that, that will have an impact on the industry too. Um, and in terms of like technology, like like how has tech like helped you grow to where you are today and expand into the U.S. market? Well, it was absolutely vital and again it was kind of a happy accident we can't, we knew we needed products and this was going back eight years nine years now in the uk market when we again we had these massive social audiences they'd follow our tips we'd give them content it was really good engagement was super high but ultimately if they're on a social platform they're going to follow you and you can't really you don't own those users they're not um overly committed to you as a brand there's no real loyalty there so what we did was we built the first bet tracking app in the UK betting market. It's called Acker Tracker. And at the time it was before you could go on a sports book. It was kind of before sports book apps really. So you couldn't track your bets live within your betting app. It was very disjointed. You have to have an ESPN or a flash score, but it just, you check the scores. You have to dig them out and find them and score through all the leagues, especially with soccer in England, there's five leagues and you go in and try to find out what the latest score is. Um, so we built an app that you would input your bet into and then it would track it and give you alerts and tell you when goals had gone in and if the, if the legs had won. And that was the first real foray into products for us. And we very quickly saw how much it resonated because we found the problem and given 
are already it's a, a very good solution at the time that just wasn't out there. So that was kind of a a real jump start for us of being like, right, well, if we're going to build these social audiences, we need to have something to co- as a companion to it. So that was the accident that we kind of discovered. But then from then, it's always been a very conscious thing that it's always front of mind that we're going to bring these products to market. Um, that, like I said before, they're going to make people's lives easier. Um, it, ultimately, for us, it comes down to the fact that we're um, bet small, win big gamblers ourselves in the company. Like That's kind of who we all are. We like to put five pounds down on a on a same game parlay and hope that it wins a thousand. And that's just who we are as people. And that's they're also the audiences we build on social because that's who our content appeals to. So it's all very organic on that front. So we like to build products that we would use ourselves. So it's a similar story when we built the betting hub app in the UK. We were all sat there on a Saturday morning before the three PM kickoffs in in the UK, trying to figure out who had the highest average over two and a half goals who had the most goals conceded. And it was basically trying to map together five different websites and averages and trying to somehow amalgamate it all on literally writing it down on notepads or on the notes app on your phone. So you just basically built an app that did it all for you and it shows you the the highest trending bets, um, the best mismatches. So you can quickly identify where the opportunities are and then you can build out your 10-leg shopping list ticket and hope it hits. Um, So yeah, like I said before, the Akashaka app was our first go at it and then the betting hub app was much more of a right well we know there's a need for this let's make this the best we can possibly make it and is, is this something that has been released in the us as well or planning to yeah so we've got the flash picks app out in the us market we've got oh. just under fifteen thousand users on there now it's a free to use betting research tool basically um parley building it gives you the stats it is all in one, so you can go on, you can choose your market, choose your sport, player prop or game lines. And then, like I say, build your bet, pull it into your bet slip, and it'll show you where you can get the best odds, and then it'll spin you out and um, instant load it into your bet slip on those um, on the operator side. So it, it works really well. We've seen good uptake on it. Um, and it's I think we've seen how much same game parlays have grown in the US. It's just absolutely dominating. It's front of all the pages on all the sportsbook apps and websites. So we wanted to build a tool that really did a job of giving the audience something to make um, make that simpler and so they can be more informed as well when they're making those decisions. It's all good seeing that 12,000 people on FanDuel have tailed yeah. the same bet, but you kind of want to know that there's a bit of logic behind that or some sort of another layer to it. Yeah, okay. and, and you know, any sportsbook I, app. Sorry, you log into, you see those, the first thing you see are those crazy parlays that you know have... Right. Very little chance of it. <laughs> so I've had a chance to play around with the Flash Picks app, which is great. You know, one thing that jumped out of me, you know, if we want to talk about the consumer facing side stuff, we could talk about tech. And, and I'd be curious to see how you guys, are, especially maybe even on the social side, are going to be using AI, you know, tools and, and, and building products, you know, using AI. But just staying on Flash Picks for a minute, I noticed, and it kind of probably is all because of you. You know, you're trying to bring social influencers or cappers or whatever you call them uh, onto flash picks, which is great. I mean, I think that's where in the U.S., if you're going to really captivate the Gen Z audience, that's that's great. What's that strategy? How are you going to broaden that? Like, how are you going to make using social really bring that flash pick is is flash picks on pace where you want it to be as far as adoption or how are you going to use social to maybe really put some kerosene on on your initiatives using social i think social is probably an interesting angle yeah it is and to be honest because the the app is relatively new it only came out really this version is september we've gone with a very sort of soft launch approach we wanted just to test it out make sure that it was right it's our first time building a product in the u.s so there was obviously some teaming issues and just the nuances of each of the different sports. So using the influencers has been really helpful because we're also able to bring them in during the build process as well and get their buy-in at that point. So they can start to help guide little parts of how the product looks, what other apps they use, what other products they use, and how can we sort of take little bits and where where can we optimize based on what they're seeing working elsewhere or what's missing elsewhere, what do they wish they had. Um, So it's also a great, it's like the perfect way to go to market. Um, compared to the other traditional advertising methods, it's the CPA for an app install is far, far lower. And we tend to see the retention being far higher because 
the op- the influencers are using our products not because we're necessarily paying them to but because they actually use it on a day-to-day basis and you see the same thing with people like Pickett. i think that's a really really good example where they've got influencer marketing is like their number one acquisition strategy but that's also the number one retention strategy because they can they're a exactly. tool that the influencers can use to sustain their brand and they can prove look here's like the picket calendar is a great example of it you can see here's my calendar here's how profitable i am so the product doesn't just you're not just using the influencers to get people in you're then showing them all the features that they're using on a daily basis so as we grow and as we release more features within the app having the influencers is a perfect mouthpiece for that and like I said before, it's the best way for us, in our opinion, to go to market with it. They're the people we want to be attracting to the app. Like I said before, it's a parlay building app. And again, Twitter and Discord communities and those people that sit on social are primarily recreational betters who will put those plus 1,000, plus 10,000 same game parlays on their sports book apps. And that's who we're really trying to target and build our products and cater it towards. And building maybe some uh, influencer celebrities like Maddie Chucks or whoever, you know, I saw on there, you know, yeah. you could really land on that. Now, taking that to the next conversation, so you have your influencers powering some of your decisions. Now, especially in the U.S., what are you looking at as far as making it more robust, maybe with technology or any AI solutions that are maybe down the line you know what are your product people talking about to you really it's just about deepening what we can offer in terms of all the markets that are available because there is so much going on and it's i think it's very easy to build a product that becomes overwhelming to a user especially someone that necessarily doesn't want to spend an hour on a research tool finding all the different little gaps and potential I don't know, plus 1.5 EV, which look, there's an absolute market for that, but that just isn't who we are. And that's not who we build our products for. Um, so for us, it's about making things as simple as possible, which is quite tough given the schedule and the, just the volume of players and markets that, are, that you can, that you can use. And there's definitely a case for using either AI or some sort of tool like that to really keep track on what people want and what people are using within our within our app and we have obviously we have different touch points in there so we can see what the most popular sections are and then try to real really focus down towards those areas rather than spending time trying to onboard 15 new nhl player prop markets but it could just be the case that there is, isn't a demand for that so really trying to plot out for the future where people are currently looking where they want to spend their money now in terms of what they're betting on and then trying to find little angles within that rather than trying to offer them something that's completely on another on another plane. Uh, without giving away any uh, great secrets, um, it sounds like you collect like a good amount of important data for operators. Um, do any of them uh, ask you to share that data or do they receive that, that data being part of your platform? Currently, there's because of the level of integration that's available in terms of it's all very siloed. So we can't, once someone leaves our app, we can't see what they go on to do. And likewise, they can't necessarily attribute all of what the traffic we're sending back to them just because of the nature of the API integrations. And um, like I said, they're quite, they're very separate. But what mm-hmm. we can do, it's great around big events like for the NBA playoffs, we'll be able to say, look, we're estimating we're going to have X amount of users based on what we've seen during the regular season. Here's how many bets they've placed through our app and here's how many legs per bet and what kind of player props they're betting on the most. So there's definitely an opportunity there for us as an affiliate to leverage that traffic and go beyond just the CPA or rev share model and have a deeper um, a deeper partnership that is really focused towards retention. And that's kind of where we've always been or in the past five years, at least in the UK, because of the way the market is there so much more mature, the opportunity for acquisition is lower. So we pivoted and became a basically a key retention partner, almost like a third party CRM arm for the operators. So that's kind of where we're getting ahead of ourselves in terms of where the market is in the US now. But as soon as it turns and it's the conversation start happening with the operators on that and the CPAs maybe start to drop or the new States, open up less. Um, I don't think there's many more coming up in the next year or two. Um, 
that's when we can really use that data to say, look, we've yeah. got this audience, we know what they're betting on and we know what they like to bet on. So we can, yeah, have a different commercial conversation or um, create something a little bit unique in the affiliate space. Yeah, makes sense. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, it sounds like a you know, really cool uh, app and definitely useful. Like, I think not only to the casual better, but <laughs> any better, you know, should definitely take a look at it. And yeah, it's, uh, fun, it's fun to play around with, and it's fun to, you know, once you make your bet, to know that you can direct, go right to, you know, DraftKings or, you know, the, your your partners. Yeah, so for us, it's just making that journey as simple as possible, which, like I say, it's been challenging with the tech limitations because of how, um, like I say, segmented they are, but I think we've done our best to, to make it as, well, it's as good as it could possibly be at the moment. And, and moving forward, like looking, you know, a year ahead, a couple of years ahead, uh, do you plan on releasing uh, other, you know, companion products or other just products that are completely different or innovative? Yeah, for us at the minute, the main focus is on really deepening the smart picks tool within the, the app, which is that's the bet research tool. So um, it's whether that then goes out on its own, it goes separate to flash picks, it just becomes a pure research tool. And we have that sort of like a standalone. Um, these are sort of conversations we're having at the minute because you're seeing the popularity of betting research tools like Rhythm, Props.cash, Outlier, um, super popular subscription-based tools that a lot of people use and there's a demand for it. I think, like I said before, there's some apps, some of those sites, for example, they are targeted more so towards a more seasoned gambler. Um, mm-hmm. If you are new and you go on those sites, it can be, overwhelming or slightly confusing you're not exactly sure what you're looking at they, i mean they do a great job of the the bar charts and you can see the green and red and it's pretty obvious sometimes but where we're really positioning ourselves is ready for california ready for texas ready for florida where these new states are going to be launching where there's people that won't know that it's good that lebron james has scored five threes in his last three when dominus dominatis sabonis hasn't been playing for the kings so it's kind of like we want to go in it's almost like the step before that we want to give them the simple data distilled down with easy to understand prompts that they can trust and they will will never be in a position for us anyway where we're giving predictions or projections within the tool we're always very much been we want to give everyone the, all the information they could possibly need to make an informed decision and then that's basically where we cut off and we draw the line there and then say that's where now it's on you as the better to decide if you want to make that bet. Um, it's interesting seeing some people using AI scores or AI models to run those projections. And I think it'll be interesting to see how that works out. But for me, with products especially, loyalty is hard to come by, especially in the gambling world. People are quite fickle. If you lose bets, it's as simple as you'll probably stop using a product. And if you've got a, something that's giving your prediction or giving a score and it loses, you could have picked the wrong three and you lose three in a row, there's a high probability you'll leave that product and won't come back. So mm-hmm. that's one of the reasons why we're very much, we want to be the last step before you place the bet. And then the decision is is on the gambler themselves. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, having that human guardrail with AI tools is probably important. If you don't want, you don't want a hallucination on a, in a, on a bet, you know, um, it could really screw up your entire platform and your integrity. Exactly. You know, I mean, you you know, the integrity of your kind of word of mouth, your social, if you, if you guys went off the rails with some kind of hallucination, um, that's not good. No, not so. Yeah. You can have have one of your influencers hallucinating and then that's excusable, but not the, not, not the model. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, Calum, this has been you know great, uh, you know super interesting topic, and you know the tool sounds amazing. Um, so one thing we usually you know finish up our conversations with is asking our guests like, where do you see you know the market going over the next several years? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think there's going to be. My guess would be there'll be some con- consolidation on the affiliate side. I think there'll be some, um, as the number of operators dwindle, like I said before, there's obviously the win bets, uni bets, 
even like 888 pulling out of the market, buying themselves out of the SI deal they had, there's overall there's going to be less opportunity for some affiliates to really sustain themselves. So I can see some consolidation happening there potentially, um, which is one of the reasons why we're really going down this product route because then we've just become a whole lot less reliant on acquisition. And like I said before, new states opening up was huge for the past three years. It was great for affiliate the affiliate market, but those are slowing down and they're not going to um, continue at the same rate. So I think I also see it switching a little bit, probably end of next football season, where the conversations that I'm having with the operators are going to shift more towards retention, lifetime value, and away from acquisition CPA. So I think that's really where where it's going. And um, there was some sort of whispers of that and some early conversations this time last year, I want to say. And then Fanatic said that they were going to launch a sports book. ESPN said they were going to launch a sports book. Bet365 went into four more states. And everyone then said, actually, this race for market share and new users isn't over yet. So we're, um, we're going to stick with CPA and drive in as much traffic as we can for a little bit. And, and, and do you anticipate going into other markets besides uh, the U.S. as part of the international expansion? Yeah, Brazil is a huge opportunity for us, particularly because of the, the nature of the sport landscape down there being soccer and soccer and soccer. So <laughs> we've got all the products we built for it. We've got um, everything ready for that for that market. We've gone live with a website that's sort of the UK content, but translated. So we're able to sort of get some feelers out there and start to see what the appetite is for, for our products in, in Brazil. But that's really the next one on our list is trying to nail that one down. Very different to the US. I thought it was hard moving over here and learning all of the different words that you've got for sporting terms and betting terms. But Brazil is yeah, literally a different language and different culture, everything. So it's a, it's a new challenge for us, but we've made some good hires and bringing people in that can really help guide that process. So we can, yeah, start to make some progress down there as well. Yeah, excellent. Well, uh, Calm, thanks again for your time. Yeah, this is this has been like super interesting. Um, everybody, go download Flash Picks. Um, nice pick. <laughs> you can, yeah, so you, you won't see us as any of the social influencers, so don't you not, worry. Not yet. Yeah, yeah you, you guys actually <laughs> seem to have some credibility. <laughs> I wish we had a subscription thing where we could give Data Art its own promo code, but we're yeah, it's free to yeah. use, so we don't need to do that. Uh, that's great. Uh, there you go. <laughs> All right. No, thank um, you very much, Russ. I appreciate it. Thanks, right. Kevin. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Bye-bye.